Good morning, Vietnam. Welcome to another episode of Vietnam Innovators. I'm your host, Hal. Today, we have a guest all the way from Boston, Tommy Vallely. He's the chairman of Fulbright University of Vietnam, as well as a number of other roles in the US, but I'll let him explain himself. Uh, he's in town because of Fulbright University of Vietnam's first commencement ceremony later this month in June. Today, we have him here to share more about that whole journey that started many, many years ago. And it's all culminated in one of the first, or the first, graduating class of Fulbright University of Vietnam. What a dream come true, right, Tommy? Thank you. Many Thank years you. in the making. Thank you. Um, we're here today to learn more about that journey and to share to our audience what had to happen to make this first class come to reality and what you see for the future of Fulbright. Um, but before we do that, sure, I'd like to just start with some rapid fire questions, get us a little warmed up here and the yeah, audience warmed, get warmed up as up. well. Uh, get the audience to know Tommy a little bit better. Uh, so Tommy, we've got a few questions for you. Uh, first question, what surprises you about Vietnam? Vietnam is full of surprises. Do not underestimate Vietnam. What does Vietnam mean to you? Oh, Vietnam is a central part of my uh, identity. Came to Vietnam as a young person in the U.S. Marines. When you're 19 years old and uh, you survive, you know, a horrific war, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that, that becomes part of you, became part of me. And I like my identity with Vietnam. What are the three qualities of the first graduating class of Fulbright University of Vietnam that you're excited about? We try to make a youngster, young person graduating from Vietnam, whatever their major might be, whatever, to be interested in the world, to be interested in different things, and to be able to keep learning all the time and innovating themselves as, as people. That's the, the main thing. What are the changes Fulbright University aims to make here in Vietnam? What we try to get our students to do is to be able to get ready for a dynamic future where things are going to be changing all the time. And you have to be able to navigate that. that. That's the most important ingredient as the DNA in Fulbright is how do you do that? And we, wanna, we don't want to just do it for Fulbright, right? We want Fulbright's example to influence the system. Mm. We want the Vietnam National Universities to, to do this, right? The way that, say, Olin College of Engineering in the United States mm -hmm. re redesigned how engineering is taught. We yep. want to redesign how undergraduate education should be looked at. On a Sunday at 10 a.m., where would you be and what would you be doing? In general, I'd be reading the New York Times. It's the only time I sit down during the week, read the actual newspaper. Uh, a paper newspaper. The print, the print edition oh, very good. Yeah. Uh, of the newspaper. Classic. It's the only day of the week I read the printed edition. Well, that's a rapid fire start for you guys. I mentioned that you're the chairman of Fulbright University yes. Vietnam. Um, please share with us what else do you do and that kind of nothing. captures nothing else. <laughs> this is your dedicated scope. I'm basically a, I, I work at Harvard University. Mm -hmm. I'm the director of the Vietnam program, a little bit the Southeast Asia program. And I study parts of problems that Vietnam's facing. Mm -hmm. So a particular problem that Vietnam is Facing, we might concentrate at Harvard on that problem for a while. Mm -hmm. So for the last few years, I've focused on energy. I okay. follow the Vietnam energy complicated dilemma mm -hmm. quite, quite well. I, I know that system well. I know the problem mm -hmm. and the opportunity and the challenges. And so I focus on that. I also study Vietnamese uh, uh, telecommunications, mm -hmm. okay. cybersecurity. Yep. Uh, I follow Vietnamese um, politics. Uh, but... I also, uh, am mostly, I'm the chairman of the board building this institution that mm -hmm. we're quite proud of. Okay. Uh, and, but I spend, most of, I spend most of my time on the board, on the board activities, well, whether it's crisis or building or coming to the graduation or recruiting a new board member or mm -hmm. the Global Advisory Board or something like that. And we'll, we'll hear more about it in yeah. a little bit as well. Yeah. But why don't we circle back in time yeah. a little bit, Tommy? I've sure, read your please. bio. Um, I know your journey in Vietnam started as a U.S. Marine in the Vietnam War, yes. which I'm sure was a very difficult time. And you didn't know at the time to make it, it, what to it, make it was difficult, it. but it was not. Um, when, I, when I went back to the United States from when I was a young person, mm. I <clears throat> was interested in American politics exclusively. And I wanted to be a politician. Mm. I, wanted to, I wanted to run for office. Okay. Uh, I, <clears throat> I was a 
political consultant for a while. And that's when I met a lot of the people who, uh, in my early career in politics, I met John Kerry and Joe Biden. Mm. They were the first two clients of uh, the same f firm, like Yet Etc. We were mm. a small consulting firm, oh, wow. and we had two clients. John Kerry and Joe Biden. Wow. So you've <laughs> known them since... Since they want... So, well, yeah. since they were... Since Joe Biden was under 30. Okay. What, what, what were their favorite drinks at the bar? Neither drink. <laughs> okay, Okay, got neither... It. Ne Biden did not drink at all. What, what, did they have coffee or tea? And, uh, they're juiced. They're not, not much, right? Okay. So neither... Responsible. Neither Kerry or Biden drink much. I yeah. think Kerry drinks a little wine. Okay. So the, the Fulbright Exchange Program was created by John Kerry. The Vietnam Education Foundation is created by Bob Kerry. The Fulbright on Teaching Program at uh, the University of Economics in Ho Chi Minh City was created by all of them. Mm -hmm. And the State Department then allowed the funding of these things. Now, we would seek out young people who want an opportunity to study in the U.S. We combined it with the Harvard Yenching Institute. So many of the senior teachers at Fulbright today, many of them went to Yenching and Fulbright. So we used, we used academic exchange as a way for us to learn more about the country that we were trying to normalize relations with. That, that's, that's, that's how it was established. So I came to Vietnam in 2016, which was just <laughs> after Fulbright University was just about. announced publicly, yeah, just, I think. Yeah. And um, I remember, that my first interactions with Fulbright were inspired. I wanted to hear like more why and you know what the outcomes would be. Seven yeah. years later, of course, we have our first graduating class, which is amazing. So my first, my, my next question for you, Tommy, is reflecting on the state of Vietnamese education. Yeah. You've seen it from the 90s all the way to today. What are the kind of milestones that you are proud of having played a part within Fulbright but also, what do you see the challenges being moving forward? Or you can even say opportunities yeah. to take a more positive. It, mm -hmm. It's a little bit unique to Vietnam. You, mm. Vietnam had the DNA. It had the DNA. It had the, it had the K through 12. V Vietnam K through 12 is not perfect, but it's pretty good. Right? So in insights, let's say Southeast Asia, I think maybe only Singapore is in the sort of level of the K through 12 education. So when we first started in Vietnam, we built a graduate school in public policy. And I, and I think if we had to redesign it, we would not have done that. We would have built the undergraduate program first, right? There's some, there would have been some problems with that, but uh, uh, we, we wanted to focus on the undergraduate education. So a lot of people have tried to build universities around the world, and most of them don't do very well. Mm. I mean, it's hard to build a, it's difficult to build a university, right? We decided at the beginning, don't build a branch campus. Don't make it uh, Yale and U.S., Singapore. Don't make it, you know, uh, NYU and, in, in, you know, Dubai. Uh, don't make it Duke, Shanghai. Build your own brand. And the two big brands that we copied were Tsinghua and the Indian IITs and the IIMs. These are both partially American. And they were driven by indigenous mechanisms in India and in China that the U.S. followed mm. and created from those societies and built them up from those societies. We're going to use that model. Okay. We're going to use that model, not the branch campus model. It Vietnamese needs to come from education within. Education and thinking has not only enabled the institution to be successful, but the institution to stand it on its own two feet. It, you don't want it to close, and you don't want it yeah. to close. You don't want, you know, I'm, I think Yale, Singapore... Closing was terrible. Right. No. Unnecessary to close it, right? Mm. The, I think the attempts by Singapore to have a liberal arts education faltered mm. because the Yale Singapore thing uh, needs to be wound down. We, we decided early on in Vietnam, and this is one of the things we actually got from two by four yep. when they recommended that we find a way to work with Viet, et cetera. We said they came up with a line the branding group, not the strategy group, mm -hmm. the branding team a two by four, came up with the strategy, incubate culture. Yeah, anyone, incubating technologies, a lot of people are gonna do that, right? Yeah. You can do that, but incubate culture. Make sure we're gonna teach at Fulbright, history of Vietnam, culture of Vietnam, whether it's the music or literature or drama or painting, whatever. We're gonna use Vietnam culture 
to embed Fulbright University in Vietnamese society. Mm. Be part of the fabric of society. Be part of the fabric. Not, yeah. know, know as much about Vietnamese society and culture as anybody in the world. Mm. Try to become first the leading institution in the world on Vietnamese culture and uh, understanding. And then add... AI, computer science, and other things. So I, I really love what you just said, which is to understand and be part of the society. Yeah. And I think that's step one. Step two, in my view, and I, I apply the same kind of thinking at Viet Cetera, is to also innovate. We yeah. want to provide some new, fresh thinking, uh, not just through how we educate, but also what we could produce um, at the institutions that we're a part of. So my next question for you, Tommy, we talk about AI, we talk about technology, yeah. different ways of working. What do you hope to see? I, I, I think if I were to ask you, what are you doing? You could talk for an hour or, or maybe for a day. Um, but what do you hope to see at a high level that Fulbright can produce in terms of the next generation yeah. of talent, but also yeah. fundamentally perhaps from a research point of view, yeah. from a curriculum point of view, yeah. what we, innovations we, we, do you hope to... Our, our goal, and we have certainly not achieved this yet, our goal is to be the apex university of Vietnam, that okay. we are the MIT, we are the Berkeley, we're the UT Austin, we're the top of the pyramid. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to get too big. We just need to be able to influence the remaining of the system is to be the apex university. And so it's, I think it's important. I think mm -hmm. you're coming to graduation, you'll see, yep. we want to be able to build at Fulbright enough, enough capacity that we can think about chemistry, computer science, and medicine. Mm -hmm. And we have in our graduating class of Fulbright, people going directly from Fulbright into PhD programs in the United States in those three areas. Mm. You have to get the concept of time down right to build an apex university. Mm -hmm. You can't just build one. Mm -hmm. you know, it takes 20 years to build one. But, but you have to start to build one. And so Vietnam never started to build one. I like the, the apex analogy. It's um, another way I put it at my company is to be top of mind. I think what's it called? Top of being top of mind. I'll uh, steal for that. us. Yeah, I mean it's it's hard to be number one in everything. Oh, you cannot, oh you if cannot, you try to be number uh, one in everything, you absolutely you're number two in everything instead. Or you can only now. do a few things really well. Mm. And so our first run at things was one, as I mentioned, get the Vietnamese culture thing down better than anyone else in the world. Be number one in the world on, in the Vietnamese culture. Number two, try to get into the computer science business. Mm. Right? Try to get into the computer science business. And we're trying to partner with the University of Texas uh, system. It's a great system. We have, we're sending one of, our, one of our graduates this year is going to the University of Dallas system in computer science. And we hope to strengthen the the, that, that connection so that we can, we can begin to build a computer science department that can deal with Vietnam's challenges in the 21st century, which are going to be more complicated than the current university system does not produce the proper engineers or, or AI specialists. Now, Vietnamese universities are good because they have good students. Right? So they might even have better students than us sometimes, mm -hmm. right? because the admissions mechanism in the Vietnam universities is quite good, right? You have to be smart to go to these places. It's hard to get in. And so a lot of smart people go to these schools. They don't necessarily have the connections to, uh, to the higher end science and technology that you might need to be apex. Right, right, okay. Tommy, where do you see Vietnam's role in Southeast Asia being? In the next decade, and I mention this because I've had a lot of discussions big. with um, <laughs> big. Uh, I've had a lot of folks, high-level delegations from Vietnam, uh, from the U.S., come over Vietnam in the past few months alone, and will over the next six months. They all they see Southeast Asia as this big pie. It's almost like where do you focus? And obviously, you're very focused on Vietnam. So, if I was a U.S. congressman or a business person, I'm talking to Valley. I have this opportunity to sit down with you. And you're pitching Vietnam. I know. I know you. You say it's it's hard to do, and Vietnam's a unique place, and that's that's totally noted. And I would yep. agree to you in yep. a lot of ways. But what are your tips through that journey that you've taken over the past 10 to 15, 20 years in the evolution of Fulbright that you could share for a potential educator? What, what I would say first and foremost is, when someone mentions the word scalability, mm. stop listening to them. All, all institutions are unique. Mm. We can think of a way to innovate a university in, uh, in Africa. 
we could innovate one of those. But we got, we got to do it through the way that you connect it to the culture. We don't have a, a cookie cutter mechanism about how to build one of these. Don't use scalability. Mm -hmm. Don't use a model from somewhere else and drag it in here and say, we're going to do this. That will most likely begin and stop at some point, the way the Yale Singapore did. So don't, scalability don't do is, is more, that's not the objective and never will be for- You gotta, you gotta, you gotta connect it to the society. So Tommy, my, my question is, uh, I'm a prospective stakeholder. You mentioned yeah. everyone from uh, the elites to the parents, to yeah. the students, all that. What should I know about Fulbright in the next few years that gets me excited to, to listen to today's podcast? I think the most important thing about Fulbright is it's, uh, it's the difference in its governing mechanism, how it's governed. And there's no representative of the U.S. government, and there's no representative of the Vietnamese government mm. on the board. Okay. And it's, it's a genuinely dynamic board mm. that is, is connected. You know, you know Fulbright is the, is the leading center in Vietnam of civil society. And that's part of our DNA. Right? That, that DNA comes from uh, an understanding that the mm. cultural and educational methods methods of Vietnam and Fulbright competes with the state apparatus. Okay. In your opinion, what's the most pressing issue that Vietnam needs to focus on and pay attention you have to? to? You have to want to be modern. You can't be like me and my me and my decide me and my army decided we are not going to be modern. We're going to be feudal. Mm. Okay, we're going to have feudalism. Right? So if you want to have feudalism, go have feudalism. Mm. But if you want to be modern, then you know you need to you need to navigate modernity. Mm. You know, Vietnam is partially good at that. The most important political uh, event in my career in Vietnam was not the 1986 economic reform, but the deregulation of the internet. Yes. The big advantage of Vietnam is openness. Mm. The competitive advantage of Vietnam is openness. So the biggest challenge is keeping it open. Mm. And the weakness in keeping it open is that the private sector is too small. Mm. But the the private sector needs to grow exponentially for Vietnam to get technology, to create technology. To, you have five shows a, a week or something when you get all the innovators that potential could come from Vietnam. You need to connect capital and innovation and create a private sector. So Vietnam private sector is you know, 12% of GDP. Mm. China's is 60. And so Vietnam's foreign invested sector is close to you know, over 25. So that... The imbalance in Vietnam, the thing that if you wanted to fix, mm -hmm. would be rapidly increase the private sector throughout Vietnam to create both economic growth, but also technology. And to do that, you also have to then improve your telecommunication system. Vietnam will, would, would need to build a cloud or something like that. Tommy, you clearly know a lot about Vietnam. You've been doing this for decades and decades. Uh, one of the last questions I always like to ask our guests is, what would you like to know more about? And that's the purpose of today's show. It's to give a snapshot to everyone from business executives to that young new graduate who wants to know more about a different type of industry or know more about their industry. So my question for you would be, what do you not know about Vietnam that you'd like to know more about? Perhaps it's a particular industry, even a person, a company, what would you like for us to highlight so that you are more informed about Vietnam today? Uh, there's things in Vietnam that I know about, but I don't know enough about. Mm. You know, I, uh, I, I, you know, when I was uh, working on the uh, Ken Burns, Lynn Novick film, mm -hmm. that's also where I learned about the Vietnam, even though I was in the war. I really learned about the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. uh, making the film, right? So yeah. my, my knowledge didn't, didn't come from me being... 19 years old in the Marines, my, my came from me being, you know, 65 and rethinking the war. I would like more knowledge of the war, mm. more knowledge of uh, what some of the decisions were being made. One of our board members is a professor of Vietnamese history at Columbia, okay. uh, Professor Lian Hang Nguyen, mm. and uh, she is kind enough to invite an old man like me to come to her class 
and to uh, and they they use the uh, Lynn, Ken Burns Lynn Novick film in class, mm. and so I'm the old guy that comes in and tells them, oh, this is how we made the film. But if I had if I could retire and learn something more, I'd learn something more about what I the journey I went on to learn about okay. the origins of the war. Do, do you think people? have enough access to content about that online and you can go online right now and watch the Ken Burns film. Okay. I mean, in Vietnam, <laughs> that's a good start. So in Vietnam, PBS, uh, so it's on, you could go to, I'm pretty sure it's there. It's there last time I checked. Mm. It's, it's called P- YouTube, uh, PBS YouTube channel mm-hmm. and in Vietnam. It has the 20 part series okay, with okay. Vietnamese subtitles. Okay. Very you can good. access today. Well, check it out. Everyone. Yeah. Great. Um, Tommy, that concludes today's Thank podcast. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful. This has been years in the making. I've yeah, heard of your name so many times. Thank you. Hope I think we've exchanged emails here and there, but right. today it's our first time meeting in person. Please, I hope to be invited back. Yeah. No, surely we will. I think, yeah, right. no, I learned an incredible amount today thank and I, I hope our audience has as well. Yeah. Uh, everybody, thank you for tuning in for another episode of Vietnam thank Innovators you. with Tommy. Uh, Tommy, it's been such a pleasure to have thank you here you. today and, here. and learn from you directly. Thank you. And here's to more uh, bilateral relationship building between the U.S. and Vietnam and, of course, education as a whole in Vietnam. Uh, can't wait to have you back on the podcast Looking next forward time. to it. Looking All right. forward to it. Thanks See you so guys much. next thank time. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.